Amen. When I think all of us here, no doubt, believe that our Lord has a name that is above every name. The Bible teaches us that at his name, one of these days, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And no doubt all of us here call upon that name, look to him, trust in him, <clears throat> and allow him to guide us. So let's sing about, sing about him.
All right. You'll be turning to Psalm 77, if you would. And hopefully my voice will hold out on a sermon. We'll see. But uh, stuff just does not want to go away whenever it grabs a hold of you. But doing good. But for some reason this evening, just wanting to come back and say hello. But I know I've said it before, uh, but we know that the book of Psalms, uh, as you read through the book of Psalms, uh, we know that it pretty much touches on every aspect of life. And so we know that if we're on the mountaintop, uh, there are Psalms that we can use that will help give our voice praise, and that just helps teach us how to worship our Lord and to focus upon Him and so we know that there are psalms for the mountaintop. Uh, but we know that we do spend a lot of times in the valley. And so there are many psalms that help us in those days of despair, in those days of difficulty. And we know that many times we have a lot of those days uh, where there are things that have went on and things that happened that uh, we don't like, uh, many times that we don't understand, uh, sometimes we don't agree with. And so we know a lot of these psalms uh, that we can sing or that we can read uh, that we can apply to our life. They give us help and hope and instruction. And that's what we find here in this psalm. This is a very powerful psalm. It uh, gives us some tremendous advice, tremendous instruction uh, whenever we find ourselves in despair. And I don't know how well you can see this picture. I just happened to run across this picture whenever I was putting my presentation together. But I was like, you know, this picture is a good picture for a lot of days, isn't it? It just seems like we're just stranded out on a rock and they're just surrounded by water, a storm in the midst of it. And, I mean, you can notice it's even a big waterfall. I like this poor fella. He's in a place that no matter which way he looks or which way he goes, uh, it just seems like there's no hope or no help for him. I don't know about you, but it's a lot of times uh, that's the way we feel. Uh, I mean, it just seems like life comes crashing in down upon us. And I think that's where the psalmist found himself. Uh, looking at his life and even looking at the lives around him and seeing the sin, uh, the wickedness, the despair. And he found himself very distraught uh, in deep, deep despair. And so what did he do? And so here in Psalm 77, and we'll read all 20 verses and then go back and make some points. Uh, but it says in Psalm 77, verse 1, I cried unto God with my voice even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God, and I was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean, gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. And I said, this is my infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee, they were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. 
the skies sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters. And thy footsteps are not known. Thou leddest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The Lord, again, we bow before you. We ask that you would speak to our hearts, teach us. Lord, help us to understand how we, in this day, in this hour, in the midst of all that surrounds us, Lord, teach us to look to you, to trust in you, to call upon you, and to follow the example that the psalmist has here in Psalm 77. And Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. And so we begin this psalm with a storm of despair. And I think it's easy to see that this psalmist found himself in a very difficult spot. We don't know for sure the purpose of writing this. I mean, there are some authors that try to guess which battle or which war or which difficulty that Israel may have found themselves in. Uh, but apparently the Lord didn't want us to know because he didn't tell us. And I think when he does that, he's letting us know that this psalm not only applies to whatever they were going through, but it applies to what we're going through. And so we can take this psalm all the way from when it was written, pick it up and put it right in our life. And it, may, it should make a difference. It can make a difference. I think all of us here understand that life is tough. I couldn't help as I read through this to think about old Job. And I know that we're familiar with Job, but I just want to remind us of some of the things that he endured, some of the things that he went through. So just listen as I read these verses. It may have been some time since you read through the book of Job. Uh, but the Bible says in Job chapter 1, it says that there was a day. <laughs> you know, some days are tougher than other. He had a tough day. It said, there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job, and said, the oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, the Sabians fell upon them and took them away, yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose, ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and he worshipped. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. That was quite a day. Everything that he had was now gone. You talk about despair. You talk about a difficult, troublesome time. Job was there. Let's skip on over to chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 7 and 8, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord to smoke Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot and to his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. And so we know the story. He lost everything, and then Satan attacked him, and now he's suffering physically in his own skin, his own flesh. Down in verse 9, his wife came unto him and said, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Talk about a tough day. I think you could pick Job up and put him right in Psalm 77. And you can see some of the pain, the torture, the agony. And of course, we understand that. Job says in Job 5, 7, Yet man is born into trouble 
as the sparks fly upward. And then all of us understand Job 14, 1. It says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. We know life is tough. There's no doubt that if we took time that we could go through, and I mean every home, every life, every family, there's some trouble. There's some pain, there's some suffering, there's some disappointment, there's some agony. I mean, none of us are exempt from trouble. None of us are exempt from those very difficult days. And so back in Psalm 77, we see that he has found himself in that situation. Looking at his life, and maybe even looking around at the society that he's in, looking at all the sorrow that surrounds him and his family, his community, and he begins to cry out. Verse 1, he says, he cries unto the Lord or unto God with his voice. And whenever you look at the meanings of these words, that word cry means to shriek. Have you ever just cried out? I mean, just, ha ah. I mean, that's, that's the, the heart attitude that this man has. I mean, he's broken, he's confused, he's distraught, he's overwhelmed, and he's crying out. And whenever you look at the word voice, it doesn't mean that he just spoke, but it means he, he, he screamed it out, he called out aloud. And so as he is looking at his situation, whatever that may be, as he's looking at his life, he's calling out to God. I mean, and it's not a quiet call. I mean, he's speaking up, and he's speaking out. And he's screaming out. Have you ever been in that position before? <laughs> Some of us have. In a position to where you're just so broken, so confused, so distraught, that you just wander away, maybe maybe even in the middle of the woods. And you just begin to cry out, God, why? God, what? God, where? And you just, I mean, just crying out. And that's the way the psalmist is. Some of you may have never done it physically, but I guarantee you you've done it. Spiritually, haven't you? Just scre screaming out in your spirit. Looking to God, crying out to God, please help, please move, please touch, please make a difference. And whenever the psalmist cried out to God, it says at the end of verse 1, that he gave ear unto me. <laughs> That's enough to shout about right there, right? Here this man was, broken, confused, fearful, and he's crying out. And the king of kings says, I hear you, son. <laughs> I, I know where you're at. I understand. And so the psalmist had the ear of God. And there's a lot of folks that we, want, we may want to get their attention, but there's none greater than the Lord. And whenever you look at verse 2, it says there in that day of his trouble, whatever trouble that may have been, he began seeking the Lord, and that certainly is the best advice. We must always seek Him, must always look to Him, call out to Him. Too often in our trouble, we turn our backs, we walk away, we drift, we don't pray, we don't read our Bible, we get out of church. Those are directions that continue to destroy. The only hope we have is to make sure that we're turning to Him. Make sure that we're calling upon Him. And whenever these words are interesting, when you look in the original language, and you see, it says, my soul ran in the night. What in the world does that mean? You know, this is a good, a good psalm for us Southerners. You notice that phrase down further, which I'll point out, I'll point out in just a little bit, I guess. Well, down to verse 8, just so you know what I'm talking about. Is his mercy clean gone? <laughs> you ever heard that phrase before? He done clean gone crazy or clear gone crazy. I mean, you know where we get a lot of our southern accents and our southern words, and, and so this is just a good southern psalm. And so, but whenever he says it is sore ran, and I'm supposing that they had words like we did or like we do back in those days, if you look, if you look at the meaning of these words in the Hebrew, it, it's a hand. And so what, what he's saying in his language He's saying, all night I lifted my hands up to God. That they stretched out, just like a runner. It says it ran. 
You know, just like a runner stretching out trying to cross the finish line or as a, a runner stretching out putting forth a lot of energy and putting forth a lot of effort and trying to win that race. He's saying all night he just stretched out his arms and stretched out his hands to God, you know, just trying to reach him, trying to gain some understanding. And so that that's the, the understanding of these verses and these words. He stretched out and his soul could not find comfort. That's a tough night. Matter of fact, verse 3 says he's overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed about the sin. He's overwhelmed about the trouble and the seemingly lack of God to address it. And you know, these first three verses, I mean, do they not apply to our day? I mean, be honest. I mean, in our day, with all that's going on in our society, you look at the sickness, you look at the sin. You look at how this world is just getting worse and worse. I mean, have we not, be honest, have we not thought these same things? Lord, Lord, why, why, where, where are you at? Why are you allowing this to go on? And and God's people, his followers are just stretching out, crying out, God, help my family. God, God, help our church. God, God, help our community. And we're just so, many times, so confused about, God, why are you not working? Why are you not solving all these problems? I think that's just a question many times that we have in our fleshly heart, is it not? I know that I have. And if we're honest, probably all of us at times, especially in this day, begin to question and wonder, you know, where is God? And it seems as though we can find no comfort. Here, he's overwhelmed. And it seems as though God is, is not aware. And it broke him so much in verse 4. He could not sleep and he could not speak. I mean, this, this psalmist, he's troubled. He's troubled deeply. You ever had problems where you lay down at the bed at night and you just toss and turn and you can't get any rest? I mean, this is where he was. You ever had things that just blew up in your face, life, and you don't even know what to say? Somebody, somebody asks you, how you doing? You're like, well, uh, 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 I, don't, I don't even know. I went and seen Johnny Pruitt, and I was telling him about, uh, well, it was actually uh, Mr. Davis several years ago whenever I was at Fairview Baptist Church. He led the music, and I guess it was one of them old sayings. You'd ask him, you'd ask him how you doing? And he'd say, well, I'm fair to Midland. You ever heard, you ever heard folks say that? Fairy to Midland, and I asked him one time, I said, well, what does that even mean, Fairy to Midland? He said, well, I ain't as good as I was when I was a kid, but I ain't dead yet. And so he's Fairy to Midland. And so here, you know, the psalmist finds himself so troubled, he can't sleep, he can't speak, he don't know what to say, he don't know how to say it. Verse 5, as he's struggling, battling, his mind begins to wander, and he remembers days where God did work. And he remembers times of God refreshing. In the midst of his struggle, he thinks back, you know, there was a day that God did move in Israel. That there was a time where it seemed as God did answer prayers. There again, does that not fit? <laughs> In the midst of our pain, our struggling, sometimes we look and say, you know, there was a day when God did move mightily. There was a time whenever God did have wondrous works. And so that, that's where he's at. He's looking back. He remembered those days where it seems that God did have power, where it seemed as though God did move. And even verse 6, interesting verse, he remembered a time Whenever he had a song in the night, look at that again, verse 6, I call to remembrance my song in the night. He gets to thinking about those old days and he thinks about days where he struggled and days where there was pain and suffering, where there was just life. And he says, you know, there was a time when I had a song in the night. It was a time whenever, whenever in spite of the pain, in spite of the suffering, in spite of all the confusion that surrounds me, there was a time in the midst of that storm I could still sing. He's lost his song. And he's not singing in the night like he did in the past. Like Paul and Silas as they're locked up in prison. And he's trying to figure out 
You know, where was this song? Why, why had he lost that song? Why had he lost that strength? Why had he lost that understanding? Why had he lost, I think you could say, that connection with God? I mean, he had storms before, and he had lost his joy. He had had battles and pains before, and it hadn't knocked him down this low. I mean, what, what's going on in his life? All these things is going through his heart, through his mind. And even verse 7, 8, and 9, just very disturbing. He begins to ask these questions. I mean, would the Lord cast off forever? I mean, as he's praying and calling out, he's saying, God, you know, have you forgotten me forever? I mean, have you cast me off to the side forever? I mean, it seems like it. Seems like you've forgotten me. Seems like you don't care anymore. He says, you know, will he be favorable no more? There was a time he experienced the favor of God. It seems like that's gone. Verse 8, is his mercy, and there's that good southern saying, is his mercy clean gone forever? I mean, there was a time that he experienced the mercy of God. Now it seems like it's gone a distant memory. Not attainable, not able to gain it. Doth his promise fail forevermore? I mean, isn't it a wonderful time whenever we read the promises of God and claim the promise of God and experience the promises of God? Here the psalmist found himself where it seemed as though the mercy was gone, the promises were failing. Verse 9, grace had been forgotten. Was he so mad that his tender mercies were shut up forever? I mean, I mean he's got he's a lot of questions going through his heart. A lot of confusion going through his mind. The psalmist in a very dark, tough, lonely place. I mean, just imagine how lonely he is. Here he is struggling, and it seems as though even God himself has forgotten. It seems as though that God himself has forsaken. You ever been there? (laughs) I'll be honest with yourself. You know you have. Some storm has come along, some pain, some difficulty, something with your children, something with your help, something with your job, society itself, and we begin to question, begin to even question God. And that's, that's where the psalmist was, just questioning this tremendous, devastating storm of despair. And then, beginning in verse 10, we see some steps of defiance. And I know normally, I was looking at this outline, normally if I have a title that says steps of defiance, it's not good. I mean, there's somebody defying God. But that's not what the psalmist is doing. He's defying him on self. He's beginning to stand against his own mind. Stand against what his heart is telling him. And you know, sometimes that's what we've got to do. Sometimes we've got to turn off our own heart. We know our hearts are wicked, the Bible says. We we can't trust our own minds. We'll deceive ourselves. Our flesh will rise up. The devil will interfere. All those things begin to confuse us. And so the psalmist, he begins to realize that God hadn't changed. (laughs) He he begins to realize that it wasn't God that had moved. He says there in verse 10, he says, And I said, this is my infirmity. This is is just my infirmity. (laughs) Could be that he's just saying, this is my lot in life. Whatever he's suffering through, whatever he's battling Whatever he has encountered, it could just be God's call. Go back to Job. Don't you know that Job had a lot of, or could have had a lot of questions, a lot of anger, and he said, the Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Very early in that storm, Job recognized, you know, God has a plan. God God is in control. I may not like it. I may not understand it. God is. I mean, it really was a high calling on Job's life. God called Job to suffer for him. (laughs) Think about Paul. Paul had the thorn in the flesh, right? 
prayed that God would take it away. God said, I'm not taking it away, but he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so the psalmist, after all these questions and doubts and confusion, he begins to get where he needs to be spiritually. And he begins to just accept God's plan. That's not always easy to do, but it is always best. It's not always easy to accept God's call. It's not always easy to accept God's plan or God's purpose, but I can assure you that it's always best. In other words, I think the psalmist is saying, you know, if, if I'm called to suffer, then so be it. He's worth it. He's worth my suffering. He's worth the pain, whatever, whatever storm he was in. I mean, whatever he was going through. You know, the Bible says that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. If you're saved and you're serving him, you love him, no matter what we face, everything's working together for good. And so we just got to trust him. We just got to rest up upon him, rely upon him. And so the psalmist begins to take that step begins to take that step of faith. And that, that's really the first thing that we got to do, right? When we find ourselves in the middle of the night, struggling, battling, just begin to say, I can't, I can't do that anymore. We have to make a choice not to trust our own heart, but to trust our Savior. Not to rest in our own mind, but to begin to rest in Him. And that's what the psalmist is doing. He's taking this first step of saying, boy, I'm listening to myself too much when I need to be listening to God. God has a purpose, God has a reason, and God has a plan. And sometimes God allows us to suffer so that he can receive the glory from it. There in verse 10, it speaks about the right hand. That's a place or a position of power, a position of authority. He says, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. So I'm going to go back and look at my life and examine it and see days and see times where God's hand, that powerful hand, that hand of authority, shored my life. I may not understand everything that's going on, but I'm going to trust in the hand of God. I may not be able to explain everything that's going on, but I'm going to understand or I'm just going to trust in His authority, His power, and really, that's the only hope we got, Right? I think we've seen, and I know I'm sick of it just like you are, the COVID scientists and doctors, they don't have no answer. You know who's got the answer, God? You look at society and all the sickness in our society, the filthiness, society doesn't have an answer. You know who's got the answer, God does. I mean, he's the families that are falling apart, the only hope is God. I mean, he's our only hope. So we need to begin to rest and trust in that mighty hand here, He's defying his own mind, defying his own heart. He's finding hope in verse 11 and remembering God's deliverance in the past. I like that song that we sing from time to time, he'll do it again. That's a good song. It's a good song to remember he's done it before and he'll do it again. He brought me through before, he'll bring me through again. He delivered me before, he'll deliver me again. He strengthened me before, he'll strengthen me again. He's a God, he knows what he's doing. Psalm 130, let me just turn over and read this, because th this verse has helped me many times in the midst of the difficulty. In Psalm 130, the Bible says in verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And many times that's all we can do. I mean, in the midst of the storm, the pain, the suffering, sometimes we may fight it, but it's just fighting against the wind, not getting nowhere. And the psalmist says, I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting on God, but it's not an empty wait. He says, I wait. My soul doth wait. And it says, in his word do I hope. And so I hope that in the midst of whatever you're suffering, as we wait on God to move, as we wait on God to answer, that we find hope in His Word. I encourage you, in the midst of those difficult nights and difficult storms, to spend time in His Word. Find, find hope reading, believing, applying the truths of God's Word. Verse 12, 
Another important passage. He says, I will meditate also of all thy work. You know, one thing that I'm guilty of, whenever there's trouble, I begin to think too much about that trouble. Whenever, whenever there's suffering, I begin to think too much about that suffering. And no doubt the psalmist had done the same. I preached a long time ago when I was a youth minister. And I was preaching about struggle and all those type things. And I said, you know, what the devil does, you know, we'll have a, a splinter in our finger. And that's the way most of our troubles are, right? They're really not that important. I mean, you think about all the troubles you've had in your life. You done forgot about them, done moved on, God's done delivered. Really wasn't that big. But what the devil does is he gets this big old magnifying glass and he puts it in between here and that splinter. And what is really small and insufficient, boy, we make a big deal out of it. Boy, I got a, I got a tree in my finger. And it's really not that important. And that's what the devil does, what our flesh does. And we begin to think too much about that trouble and the effects of that trouble and the, the difficult. The psalmist says, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to meditate on him. And instead of just focusing on the trial, the trouble, he says, I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to meditate upon him and what God had done and what God had accomplished. And that's good advice. I mean, this is good stuff. I mean, this is stuff that makes a difference in the midst of our trials. He said, I'm going to meditate on him. He's not going to stop there. He goes on a little further. He said, not only am I going to meditate, in verse 12, he says, and talk of thy doings. Now that's a testimony right there. Here's the psalmist in the midst of whatever pain and suffering that he's in, whatever storm. You know what most of us do? We sit around the fire pit and tell all our war stories and complain and gripe and get bitter and upset. And You know, anybody asked, how you doing? Is anybody you know you're scared to ask, how you doing? Because you know you're going to be there for about two hours hearing all their aches and pains and troubles and all the... You know what's even better to do? Begin to talk about him. So you know, I'm in a storm. But my God's going to deliver me. His, his grace is sufficient. Meditate on him and begin to use that as an opportunity to magnify him. Because there's a lot of folks in this world that are going through the same problems we're going through and they don't have the answers. And God wants to use us to be that example. And so those in our family, those at work, those in our community, you know, they see that we're going through the same pain, the same struggles, the same difficulties that they're going through. And they look at us and they see that we're meditating on the scripture, that we're trusting and finding strength in our God. And we just begin to tell others. You know, say so this has been the most difficult thing that I've faced in my life. But every step of the way, God's grace has been sufficient. Every, every step of the way, God has not forgotten me. God has not forsaken me. That's quite a testimony. And that's what the psalmist, he says, I've got a testimony and I'm going to meditate on him and I'm even going to talk about him. So it involves our mind, our mouth. And in verse 13, it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And so he's finding strength by going to the sanctuary, going to a place where he can be cleansed from his sin and also going to a place where he can find fellowship from other believers. And that's what a benefit that is, to be able to go to God's house, uh, to find a place where we can get down on our face before God and call out to Him, but also be strengthened and encouraged by other believers, other like-minded followers of Christ. And so God ministers in His church with the Holy Ghost, with fellow believers. Psalm 77, we've seen a lot of pain. We've seen a lot of confusion. We've seen a lot of suffering. We've seen this man cry out, the shrieking to God, not sleeping. I mean, I mean, we, we've seen a man that's suffering. But notice what happens. After, after he begins to recognize that God hasn't changed, he has, and he begins to meditate on the Lord, begins to talk about the Lord, begins to 
go to the sanctuary, find cleansing and strengthening. Look at the end of verse 13. He says, who is so great a God as our God? Well, that's a difference, isn't it? <laughs> Instead of questioning and wondering, he begins, his heart begins to say, you know, there's no God like my God. That there are a lot of false gods, a lot of folks that are deceived, but he's saying, I haven't been deceived. My God is God. He is real. And you can see his faith being strengthened in verse 14 and 15. He says, Thou art the God that does wonders. You have declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people and sons of Jacob. And jo You can see his faith being strengthened. He, see, he begins to climb out of that hole. Begins to come out of that dark night. And his faith is being strengthened. He's saying, you are God. You are the one that delivers. You are the one that brings us out from all the pressure that we're under. Then, in the midst of all that I faced, you didn't leave me. <laughs> in the midst of all of my fear and my confusion, you was by my side. I was wrong. I didn't see you because I wasn't looking. I was too focused on my pain and my suffering, my complaining, when I should have been focused upon you. I think you can see the psalmist climbing out of that hole. I think you can see the psalmist getting closer and closer to where he needs to be. And then it begins magnifying the strength of the deliverer. So just, just, we're just going to read these. Verse 16. The waters saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee that were afraid. The depths also were troubled. He brings to remembrance the parting of the sea. That was an obstacle that they could not get through. And God provided a way. I don't know what you're facing tonight, but God is the answer and he provides the way. It may seem as though that there's an obstacle before you that you can't overcome. And really, you can't. But he can. He can. Verse 17 and 18, the clouds poured out water. The sky sent a sound. Thine arrows, which is the lightning, also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. This is quite a storm. Quite a storm. A storm of deliverance. A storm of authority. We know the same storm that frightens is also the same storm that waters the earth and fills the lakes, right? God works through those difficulties. God is a God that has the power and authority over all. He is the God of authority, and we all must submit to Him. You know, what, what some authors magnify in those two verses uh, is that similar to the storm that arose whenever God gave the Ten Commandments. And whenever... God gave those commandments. There was lightning and thunderings and roaring and all those type things. And so the psalmist is just magnifying that he is God. That he is the God of authority. And what he says is true. <laughs> we must submit. We must surrender. And we must follow. And then verse 19. Thy way is in the sea. Thy path in great waters. Thy footsteps are not known. That just magnifies the greatness of our God. There's none other that has a path through the seas. <laughs> the seas are a great, a, a great barrier, right? I mean, there, there's no way that you and I can cross the sea. And I'm just talking about in ourselves, our own strength, our own ability. We know Jesus doesn't have that problem. The Bible says he just walks on the water. But where we have no path, where we have no access, He does. Where we have no authority, He does. And one thing about walking on water, and there's no doubt if you go back to that day whenever Jesus was walking on water, you know, He, he went walking out there. Now, if He had been walking through the snow, you could have said He came from that way. If He had been walking through the mud, He came from that direction. He was walking on the water. You know, if we could pause that scene and step out there with Jesus, there wouldn't be no footprints. <laughs> He's walking on water. He just goes away. And our God, 
is far greater than we. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that we can't put God in a box? That he's far greater, moves and, and has authority far greater than what we do. In verse 19 and 20 there, Israel was led by God in the desert, pillar of fire, cloud. God provided, God protected. Now what a God we serve. There are times that all of us find ourselves looking at our sorrow, looking at our sin, looking at our society, and we become overwhelmed, become distraught, become fearful. At that point, we need to stop. We just need to stop. I know it was mentioned just a minute ago about someone that just took their life. And it happens all the time. Someone to get so distraught, so discouraged, and it seems like there's no answer. Seems like there's no way out. And they just end it all. And if it weren't for the grace of God, that's where we'd all be. And so when we find ourselves being overwhelmed, when we find ourselves being outnumbered, quit, quit looking at your life and your problems and your struggles and begin to focus on Him. Begin to focus on Him. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He knows. He understands. He says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know what all you're going through, but he does. I don't have the answer, but he does. He does. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to pray. And my voice made it through. I also didn't think it was going to. Whenever I was up here with Janice, it was like gone. <laughs> Lord, we do again bow before you. And no doubt if each one of us were honest, we found ourselves exactly where the psalmist found himself. In the middle of the night, broken, confused, angered, aggravated, frustrated, depressed, and deep despair. Lord, each one of us here at different points in our life, and maybe even now, have found ourselves in those nights, in those storms, in those pains. God, I thank you for Psalm 77. And Lord, may that be a strength to each one of us, that when we find ourselves in those nights of despair, that we begin to realize that you are God, that you have not forgotten, that you have not forsaken, that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, that we're your children and that there's always hope. There's always deliverance. There's always grace. There's always mercy. There's always strength. But we're your children. And you've promised in your word that you'll always be there. So no matter how dark the night may come. Lord, well, may you teach us to just look upon you, to trust in you, to lean upon you, and allow you to lead us. Lord, well, we pray this prayer in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.